Coming up on this edition of Newton Newsmakers, Newton is one of the Boston area's most sought after places to live. Safe, convenient, community spirit, and an excellent school system that's motivating more and more families with school-aged children to move here. But as our student population swells, what's the city's plan to keep up with the demand? Today, we'll talk with three members of the Newton School Committee, Jeff Epstein, Steve Siegel, and Jonathan Yo, to get their take on the road ahead, delivering on the reputation and promise of the Newton Public School System, next on Newton Newsmakers. Newton Newsmakers is made possible through the volunteer production efforts of the employees of Mass Media and Big City Publishing and through the support of Newton residents like you. Hi everybody, welcome to Newton Newsmakers. I'm Charlie Shapiro. Two high schools, four middle, 15 elementary, 12,000 students, an annual budget of over $170 million. The city of Newton rightfully prides itself on providing a quality education for students of all abilities and learning styles. And while our educators are obviously by far the most important ingredient, having a physical environment in which to teach and in which to learn is clearly a critical component too. Some believe the decision to close and sell off some of the schools a generation ago has come back to bite us, but it really doesn't matter because we are where we are and we're short on space and we need to do something about it. Enrollment's on the rise, that's because we are a wonderful place to live. So the budget, unfortunately, is not always cooperating with our needs. It's going to take some expertise, creativity, community will and some new ways of addressing the challenges ahead. We have three of the folks that will be working on that uh, for the foreseeable future and they are Jonathan Yo, who's been on the school committee now for uh, this is your fourth term Correct. I believe. Yeah. Okay. We also have Jeff Epstein and we have Steve Siegel who is in his first term on the school committee and I think uh, Jeff you're in your th Third, third, right? Third okay. So, uh, so these folks are uh, some of the folks that are representing you and making decisions. And why don't we start off with Jonathan, because you've really been instrumental mm -hmm. in dealing with a lot of the facility needs, the planning, and the concepts of how the city can take uh, some significant challenges and move forward. In the past year, uh, uh, Day, Car, Anger, a number of other mm -hmm. things have been on the table. How about a little bit of a status report on what's got us to this point and what's been accomplished for the last year and you know really where we need to go from here. Just following up in your intro Charlie, um, we have um, as you know 15 elementary schools and we have um, we have two different challenges here. We have uh, finding and creating appropriate teaching and learning space. Um, we have many buildings that are really obsolete or outdated in terms of uh, space and technology. Um, and also we have in rising enrollments. So we have a space crunch, especially um, in our elementary schools and in our middle schools. So where we are right now is that we have um, um, added um, space into our middle schools. Uh, Oak Hill, we had four modulars added a couple years ago. And we're about to add six classrooms and enlarge the cafeteria at Day Middle School. At that point, along with a little bit of work at Brown Middle School, we expect to be in pretty good shape um, around the middle school level. Obviously our high schools, we've recently uh, worked on both of our high schools. We think we have enough space there for many years to come. The el elementary schools is our focus um, beyond, um, uh, beyond day. And so where we are is we're moving forward with the Anger um, Elementary School with the Massachusetts School Building Assistance Program to get state funding, probably at least 35% um, funding from the state. And we, are, we have started that process. Um, Steve and I are on the uh, school building committee, which just had a kickoff meeting uh, this mm -hmm. week. Um, Bob Rooney from the city um, has kick, kicked that off with some neighborhood representatives. So we're um, working on a feasibility study um, over the next year, year and a half, to decide what exactly is going to happen at Anger. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, really, the, the other major piece is we're beginning to um, get some proposals from the school administration, from Sandy Gurian, who is our deputy superintendent and chief administrator officer, on what, is, what might be some ideas for solving our space and, and, um, and space challenges um, in the foreseeable future. And so she made a presentation um, um, recently here in April um, before the school committee, and we're going to have further discussions in May and then with the Board of Aldermen in June. So, Really, what we're you know where we are right now is the beginning of an additional process around long-range planning. Okay, so Jeff, in the three terms you've been on, how have you seen the needs 
evolve? Well, I think it's, it's been pretty set piece to this point in terms of Oak Hill and Day, like Jonathan just said, and they were kind of fairly straightforward. Now we're moving into a much more strategic phase, which is aligned with SETI's uh, capital plan for the city, mm -hmm. dovetails into that. And so for the first time, we're engaging in that kind of process, and the administration that we have is engaged in it. So we've got uh, following up what I would say is very substantial success with managing the budget and with, say, the special education review and implementation of those things, which is very analytic, data-driven, student-focused. We're doing the same thing here with buildings. And what's good now is Sandy, who's just been doing a terrific job along with her team, has set up a framework which not only allows us to discuss things and see how they work, but allows the community to see it. So uh, I think we've, we're really making a big change here which everyone's on board with, and it provides a great vehicle for discussion. Okay, so Steve, uh, you're <coughs> relatively a rookie to the, to the school committee. Um, as you ran in, uh, in the process of getting elected, uh, uh, over the, actually twice over the past couple of years, this time, you, uh, past uh, four years, this time you were successful, congratulations on that. What are some of the things that you heard along the campaign trail and from constituents, not just in Ward 5, but across the whole city, that feed into what the perception of the city's needs are versus now that you're in office, what have become the reality of those needs from what you're seeing? Um, I think that uh, the, the perception that people have had about, uh, the perception that I've had about the needs uh, of, our, of our city and of, since we're talking about facilities, I'll say of, uh, of our facility needs is, um, uh, what I've observed since I've been here has been consistent with what I uh, believe to be the case when I was running. Uh, I have access to a lot more information. Uh, I'm engaging with uh, people who are directly involved in the, uh, the facilities planning processes. Um, but I, I don't think that um, I've seen anything new. I've just seen much more detail. Um, I did want to say, I wanted to add uh, two quick points uh, to uh, what both of my colleagues said. Uh, to Jeff, who was talking about it, about a new process, one of the things that's really fascinating to me about the process we're in around facilities now is that in our 2007 uh, long-range facilities plan for schools, it was for schools. And uh, it was a good exploration of what our needs were, but it, it was outside of the context of the full package of city needs. And so what SETI has done with the CIP, which is a, starting out as a five-year plan, is he's been looking at facilities needs for our school buildings, our city buildings, our roads, our parks, our, our water and sewer infrastructure. And so we can consider um, sort of what we want to try and achieve in the full context of city need, not just school buildings. And I think that's a strength of, uh, of the process. Okay, so what, what everybody had been talking about uh, from the CAG to the Blue Ribbon, all of these various uh, citizen input opportunities uh, that, that the various groups and individuals had was always get the contract squared away, which SETI has done. Yes, and the school committee. And yeah. the right. school committee. Yes. Right. Uh, well, and, and, and that's a good point, though. Because <laughs> no, but that's, <laughs> a, that's <laughs> right. No, but you know what? That's, a, that's, a, that's, no. a, that's an extremely important point yes. because... Uh, it was done in a more collaborative fashion. Absolutely. Yes. I think a lot oh, of people absolutely. would agree yeah. that in yes. previous years, and interestingly enough, and, and uh, uh, you, were part the of, chairman, you, yeah. you were the chairman of the yeah. negotiating team, I believe, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so clearly you had a major impact on this. Um, yeah, the whole, and the whole school committee was involved um, mm -hmm. throughout yeah, the process. Yeah, it was a great process. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, so it seems to have made a difference in the, in the tone and the structure and the path that the mayor took that allowed this to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, uh, in previous years, the contracts with the schools had come first, uh, and the city contracts, in many cases, had come after that. Mm -hmm. In this particular structure, there was a new paradigm to, That's to right. some degree. Um, how important was that shift in your mind to well, be able to come up with the structure? It was, it was large in that we have a chief financial officer, Maureen Lemieux, who was extremely helpful in helping us redesign health insurance in particular. It was a real, uh, a real big um, issue um, in this last um, negotiation. So her involvement um, and the mayor's involvement with the school committee working in partnership was, was, was a real difference maker. And also, 
We, when we privatized uh, the school lunch program and saved over a million dollars a year, really it was a cooperative effort. And I think, you know, where Steve was going is that this, this really represents a big shift in um, the relationship between the city side and the school side. And mm -hmm. the two sides are working extremely well together. We're meeting every single week with the professionals that work for the city and the public buildings department, Stephanie Gilman our uh, public buildings commissioner and Sandy Gurney from the school side, Mike Cronin from the school side. So there's a lot of cooperation going on, not just around these long range projects, but around maintenance. And we've really improved the maintenance um, in our school buildings and I think on, in other buildings across the city. Well, maintenance has been underfunded for years That's right. in many ways. You know, we had uh, another one of your colleagues on the school committee, Matt Hills, was here uh, along with Scott Lennon, the, the uh, president of the Newton Board of Aldermen, and there was a discussion that we had uh, separate from this, but obviously uh, everything does come back to the budget and, you know, there's some pretty significant underfunding that's been going on for a very mm -hmm. long time. <clears throat> so. Um, when we, talk, when we start talking about the facilities in particular and the way that uh, Sandy Gurian uh, put together mm -hmm. uh, uh, a, a different way of looking at it, you know, without picking that apart, because I don't think that's what we need mm -hmm. to do here. I think that's more of a citizen <coughs> input and, and a deliberate, uh, deliberative type of structure that can go on with the appropriate body with the, with the school committee, obviously, and public hearings and all of that. That being put together, though, appears to have been done in a fashion that is dramatically different than how that type of program and plan has been done in the past. Mm -hmm. right. And that, that picks up on the prior things. So in the collective bargaining, there was a very strong partnership between Sandy Gurian, our financial expert, and the city financial expert, uh, Maureen Lemieux. And they have now the analytic power that they can control to project properly. So, and it's not just, uh, um, that they can do that, but they also shared it with the teachers union. And so the teachers union in negotiations had a very powerful tool, tool to look at the consequences of any uh, suggestions so they could tell down to the teacher level. So the analytic background here and the support tools are really important. How and unusual so you, is that, to share information like that? Well, I thought that was, un I, maybe you know, mm -hmm. but I thought it was unprecedented, actually. Yeah, I'm sure there's some towns in some cities where there's uh, some level of real strong cooperation. But I, from what I've heard talking to other school committees and other cities, um, this is we're pretty highly integrated right now. And right. really, it, it gets back to, as Steve was saying, this, this, the mayor's push around having integrated capital improvement plan. And this, he talked about this on the campaign trail, and he's gotten it off and running and um, and had meetings around the city talking about mm -hmm. all of the needs, um, not just one component, right. but all of our needs. And just, and to, the, to, just to make one more point, uh, <coughs> so, as you see that having happened successfully in the, in the uh, bargaining situation with different parties engaged, collaborating with these tools, connecting them, so you would have hoped that with the facilities planning a similar thing will happen, that those tools will be able to show various scenarios to allow all of the parties involved to understand it. So it's, it's a continuity of improvement of analytics, I think. So Steve, how do you, uh, and anybody else can chime in on this sure. as well, how do you uh, rate in terms of importance. I know this is very, very difficult to do. I rate as one of the most important people on the yeah, school committee. Is that right? <laughs> and your modesty precedes you. Um, no, but uh, modest man. How do you? Uh, well, once you've perfected modesty, everything else is easy. Well, we have free structural engineering uh, advice now. At Here we go. I do get tapped. Um, well, and actually, you know, we can start off with that because obviously the physical structure, the uh, all of that, uh, you're, you're, you do. Have have a, a, a wealth of knowledge in that, and so obviously that can be critical to the process moving forward and your ability to chime in on some of that as a professional. However, there are an awful lot of things involved that people are concerned about. You know, Jonathan mentioned, you know, some of the buildings, you know, being, uh, you know, either, uh, you know, not falling apart or crumbling, but certainly in need of some pretty significant mm -hmm. work, especially the elementary schools. You've noticed that. I'm, yeah, I'm I mean, there's been very little investment for a generation or more in, the, in our school buildings, and there should be steady investment in our buildings. Uh, mm -hmm. the, otherwise, they, uh, they do deteriorate. So. so other than the physical buildings themselves, is it about class size? Is it about uh, the, the, the depth and breadth of programs? Is it about, you know, there's a lot Are of Are you asking, is that what's driving our facilities need? Or? Yeah. Well, um, 
I mean, it's, it's a little bit of everything. You know, we're trying to build buildings that will respond to philosophies of teaching and learning. Uh, we're trying to build buildings that are sufficiently sized to, uh, to, to house the school population. And, uh, and um, so these, these incorporate, I think, what you're asking. Um, I think just on, on that issue, Steve, I think we also have, we have a lot of t teaching and learning environment situational problems in our elementary schools. We do not have adequate um, space for lunch. Um, we do not have um, uh, enough uh, gym space in some schools, art rooms in other schools, and uh, breakout space for special education or English language learners or uh, differentiated instruction. And at this point, we're trying to now split many of our classrooms, depending on the subject, in, up into multiple right. uh, groups so that kids can be pushed and moved forward with, with teams of, of specialists. And so we need flexible space, and many of our school um, buildings right now just don't, don't provide that. And there's a whole long list of other um, right. educational challenges. We have, we have people, uh, students learning in the hallways, we have storage in hallways, which I'm sure the fire department isn't happy about. So we have a lot of um, building needs mm -hmm. uh, across the system that we are trying to address by tackling um, some big projects, but also, as Sandy has presented, at least here, is to um, look at some smaller projects where we're adding two, four, six classrooms and maybe adding a cafeteria or fixing right. some other problem and in the building. That's really, uh, when you say adding, that's one of the major things here. Is yeah. It's not just, it's flexibility in buildings, it's the yeah. condition of the buildings, but we have another five or 600 kids coming in in the next mm -hmm. five years, as we did in the last five years. So we've got this big wave of additional students that you have to expand capacity. Mm -hmm. So that's important for two reasons. One is you've got to provide the facility expansion, and that's why adding classrooms mm -hmm. is important. But most notably, and there's just recently voted budget, we had 2.7, well, what was that, 2.7 million for mm -hmm. the additional students. We would have been at sustainable 2.5% increase, except for a loss of federal funds of about mm -hmm. uh, a million. But very much so, this population surge needed uh, this other two and a, was it two and a half? Two, 1.7 yeah. million. Right. Sorry, 1.7, I yeah. got the number wrong. <clears throat> 1.7 million this year. Now, we've got this wave keeping on going, so we have a recurring problem each year of the order of 1.3 million in each of the next four years mm -hmm. of additional budget money needed to put teachers in the classrooms that we're going to add. So Wh that's another Which topic. brings up an interesting dynamic because you don't want a stagnant community. Mm -hmm. We're constantly looking at ways, whether it's Riverside or wherever else, uh, Newton Center, uh, Austin Street, uh, there's a number of different places where construction, which would be mixed use, can happen. Mm -hmm. Definition of mixed use is generally add housing units. How do we balance out and project what is a reasonable quantity of additional housing to be welcoming and bring new people and families with kids that need to be educated into the community, but also understand that there are financial limitations to our ability to deliver on the services when those folks do come in. Huge question, I realize. It is. But it's a pretty I'll important one, I yeah. think, isn't it? It is. Well, it's, it a, is. it's a great question. It's a, it's a really, and, and you know, one of the things that underpins this, if you just look at some numbers, um, if a, a, you build a new single family house and the tax dollars that come out of that single family house, unless it's a $5 million house, won't cover the cost uh, that the kids uh, represent to the school system. And so similarly, when we're looking at a project like Riverside, um, if there are many children that come into our school system, the, so this is one way to answer your question. Uh, as a mixed use project, one looks to provide enough uh, other types of uses, be it retail, be it commercial, be it office space, so that um, we bring in tax dollars from those and those don't directly come against our school system. So that we have tax dollars that will help support the children that are there. Yeah. So this is just one way to start to think it about is. it. It is, and I know the Board of Aldermen is, is tackling with this exact issue. When I think it's important to remember that much of the growth in our population has not been from the big developments. It's been from your right. average homes and right. Newton turning mm -hmm. over. In, Do you mean in the school population? School population. The general population. The school population. Okay. Right. Um, they've certainly, the Avalon developments and Arbor Point at, at Woodland have certainly added um, uh, students, but it's, it's a fraction of the overall growth here in Newton because you know, more families are moving here. 
and I think it depends on the type of development. If Riverside is mostly single bedroom apartments, we don't see many kids uh, from those kinds of units in here in Newton. Mm -hmm. As you get into two bedroom and three bedroom, you, we are gonna see uh, more students. They're not, fortunately, they don't all come at the elementary level. We, we often have families move into Newton for our middle and high schools. So when you, when you think about students coming out of a new development, it's, it's, it's K through 12. It's really the whole, almost the whole range of the grades. So it's so, something so, to think so about. So being dispersed across those yeah. grades, is there a percentage that's larger in the younger years? I mean, we, I mean we're known for delivering excellent uh, education in, all yep. across the board, sure, but uh, young families come to Newton specifically. Right. They do because of our elementary schools. Right, right. and I think th th there's some who come to rent here, maybe that are more mobile, but they're coming maybe just for the high schools um, mm -hmm. or, or for the middle school. So it's, the problem is you can't really predict who's gonna move in and what the age of their kids are, so it's. Well, you, can predict, you can't predict who's gonna move in or, or whatever, nor maybe you yeah. shouldn't be anyway, but right. you know, I mean, that would be sort of right. self-selecting yeah, to some degree, but, but you can. But we should be yeah, conservative. To, you yeah. can predict yeah. what you're yeah. going to build yeah. or allow to be built. Yeah. Right, we can build. manage that, but <coughs> we also have the dem demography which is being used, but there's yeah. a, an error. And right. one of the things that I think is really important is to provide enough capacity. That's right. So we gotta be conservative on that because we ramped it down pretty fast over the last couple of decades, two, three decades and everyone would say we closed too many schools. Mm -hmm. So now we have to make sure we have enough capacity with a the, bit the, of... The last time you know. we had this many kids in our elementary schools, around 1980, we had 20 elementary schools. So just think about that. And even now, we have greater right. needs in our buildings for um, learning, for, for students of different learning styles. Mm -hmm. so we need different space for them. So it's, we have a big right. challenge. And there's, there's one other <coughs> important thing, and that is mm -hmm. uh, relating to special education because what happened in the, the last budget was we're trying to bring in uh, kids, particularly in the middle school, who we have had in out of district placements. So we're trying to follow best practices and bring them in. And that ac actually affected the design of day middle school because we want the right kind of spaces mm -hmm. for those kids to be operating there. So it has a lot of connections as you're trying to bring people back in, which gives you better outcomes for the kids and mm -hmm. often is lower cost then you need the facility adjustments to accommodate them. So it's very interesting. So, so with, with, the, uh, with the plan or with the new way of thinking, uh, with having all of these basically be a dynamic discussion, right. uh, what can people expect? Where can people go, for mm -hmm. example, to hear uh, your discussion? And obviously, New TV carries the school committee yes. meetings. People could, in fact, leave their homes and come up and sh <coughs> you know, show up in person. That is allowed. <laughs> Uh, you, there are ways to get involved, obviously, but the convenience of watching on TV for a lot of people is very helpful, and I know that's one of the new TV's most watched programs. Um, but are, are there opportunities other than the public comment at the beginning for people to be able to either reach uh, each of you individually as representatives, or like how can somebody get a better sense of what's happening so that people can be educated about the process, about the needs, about their input opportunities, and so as this collaboration is happening between the city and the, uh, side and the school side, how can residents become a part of that? Well, you know, there are a thousand meetings that are taking place every month uh, around our facilities at, at different levels. So certainly, uh, you know, people can look at those, but that's not really a, a, a clearinghouse of information. There's lots of details. I mean, I, I think, you know, what your question brings to my mind is, is uh, the idea that it might be beneficial for us to have a, uh, a community meeting at some interval where uh, the, the key topics of the day or you know the status reports of some of our key projects mm -hmm. are put out there and there can be a free and open question and answer because otherwise there's a lot of activity that's very fragmented uh, yeah. across the city so but, yeah. yeah I think the the you know the school committee meetings um, certainly are on television and we some people do come to them but Many people watch on television or check our website. All this, the, the Sandy Gurian's presentation is on our website. We certainly read all of our email. We what, get, what's the website for that? It's uh, uh, www3 um, www3 at um, newton.k12.ma.us. Right. Right. You know what? Google Newton Public Schools. You know what I'm saying? Newton Public Schools, you get it. You'll get it. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, newtonma.gov, and there's a link to and the you schools can link. You right, right, right from there. Maybe that's the easiest right. way, newtonma.gov. Right. But yeah. there's a complimentary thing. There's the meetings and all of those things, which will be part of the process. But yeah. 
what Sandy's doing by developing scenarios is actually providing us a vehicle to visualize <coughs> different alternatives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would say that uh, not only could we go to the web to look at the reports, but it might be that we can make those things a bit easier to follow mm -hmm. because we're, we're trying to get the community to understand the scenarios and there's two at the moment but there might be uh, multiple other ones and then you with all the moving pieces <coughs> special education mm -hmm. population increase uh, different program demands facility uh, condition and so on there's a lot of moving parts to this so then they can see the trade-offs and see mm -hmm. those different things so I think online is is actually very important for well, the, the reality of this 50, the community has to have some type of uh, not just psychological buy-in but at some point to accomplish the goals there must be some type of uh, you know I don't I'm not going to hear the whole override conversation but there there does right. have to be yeah. some type of additional investment because you can't you can't build the new stuff you can't fix up the old stuff and still offer every program that's being offered at the high level it's being offered. It's just a technical, right. physical impossibility. Yeah. This, yes. this fall, um, I think I believe it's the mayor's um, plan to outline a program um, of the different uh, possibilities and talk about funding um, needs uh, to, do the, to do the whole program. So I, you know, I think over the next six months, there's going to be a lot of work um, and a lot of public process and then the mayor will put forward something that we'll, we'll then be working on, hopefully as a team, right. with the Board of Aldermen. And, mm -hmm. and we're really planning here. It isn't like we just built something there, you're going to pay for it. It's we're really trying to plan it and get people on board. And I, I think this is just terrific progress for us. Well, I'd like to thank you all for being here. The time goes by very yes, quickly. Very quickly. <laughs> all right, Jonathan Yeo, uh, right. Jeff Epstein and Steve Siegel, members of the Newton School Committee. If you've missed any part of the program, I invite you to visit newtonnewsmakers.org. You can view the entire program on demand 24-7. You can also sign up for our monthly update. It's free. If you have any ideas on topics you'd like to see covered on the program, just let us know. That's it for this edition of Newton Newsmakers. I'm Charlie Shapiro. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Newton Newsmakers is made possible through the volunteer production efforts of the employees of Mass Media and Big City Publishing, and through the support of Newton residents like you. Remember that morning I was getting dressed, I had the TV on, and they cut uh, to show a plane crashing into one of the towers. And I thought, wow, uh, how did that happen? I, I couldn't envision it being a terrorist activity. I was listening to the radio when they announced that a second plane had hit. And at that point I said, no, it cannot be an accident. This has got to be some uh, concerted effort and then you hear about attacking the Pentagon and then you hear about the plane crashing in Pennsylvania and you start thinking my god what's going on I served in the Marine Corps and uh, as you're taught to remember those who have gone before I think it's important that we remember this and I think it's important to remember those who you know gave their lives on that that day